Good afternoon, everyone. I am Commerce Next co-founder, Veronica Sansev. And for those that are new, Commerce Next is a community event series and conference for marketers at retail and direct-to-consumer brands. And on behalf of my fellow co-founders, Scott Silverman and Alan Dick, I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Our topic today is how to drive holiday growth from your loyalty program. And I know we focused a lot on loyalty recently. This is partially because of the industry's refocus on retention. But today we're going to go deep on loyalty programs specifically, which is not something we've covered before. We're going to spend the next hour discussing best practices for creating and optimizing your loyalty program, as well as share strategies for catalyzing loyalty customers around this holiday season. Now, before we dig in, I want to walk through a few thank yous and announcements. So first, I want to thank Imparity. Um, they have been helping brands optimize their loyalty programs through better customer insights, and we are delighted to partner with them on this webinar. I also want to thank our amazing speakers, starting with Ekta Chopra, Chief Digital Officer at Elf Beauty, Stephanie O'Sullivan, VP of Growth at Savage X Fenty, Wu Kim, Senior Director of E-Commerce at Aerosols, and David Henry, Director of Product Marketing at Imparity. This week's speakers are experts when it comes to loyalty programs, and we're lucky to have them join us today. We will be sending our speakers thank you gifts via our gifting partner gift now as a small token of our appreciation. And the good news is we'll also be sending five lucky audience members gifts as well. We will randomly select five people from this group who is tuning in live. Sorry for anyone who is watching the replay. Oops, our next slide here. Um, our webinar topic for next week is a new year, a new e-commerce reality, different, differentiating through digital experiences. It's on Wednesday, November 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific time. And it features Kate Spade, Hanky Panky, Astral Brands, and AB Tasty. As we start planning for 2022, which, you know, is right around the corner, this webinar will be incredibly helpful for thinking through personalization and your e-commerce roadmap for the next year. If you're interested in signing up, you can learn more at commercenext.com. And then our most recent podcast features Mira Patia, COO at Fabletics. I had the pleasure of interviewing Mira for this podcast and learning about how Textile thinks about membership models, agility, and mentorship. You can find out more at commercenext.com or wherever you get your wherever you get your podcasts, including iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Now, if you missed any of our past events, our webinars, our summit, all of that content is on YouTube. Um, you can find it at youtube.com slash commercenext. We have a wealth of information on there. And if you're interested in learning about upcoming videos, just subscribe and then you'll be notified when we post new videos on YouTube. Now, for those that are new, I'm gonna walk through a few quick housekeeping items and then we'll dig right in. Don't worry if you miss anything, we are recording this. We usually post the webinar recording at the next day. So you'll be able to watch it on replay. Um, I'm gonna take a quick moment to show you where everything is on the screen. So the main panel on the right is where all the interactivity happens. You have chat, Q&A, polls, and handouts. So chat is where you can give the speakers high fives and interact with other audience members. We love it when you engage and ask questions and, and, and really interact during the webinar. Um, the place where you ask questions is the QA tab, and we want you to ask your questions in there for a specific reason. It has some additional functionality, and I'm going to show you that in a second. So if you have a question, you just enter the question in the bottom of the QA tab. And then when the question is posted, you have the ability to upvote questions, and anyone can upvote questions, but that functionality helps us know which questions we should prioritize for our speakers. Um, so definitely um, take a look at that and make sure you let your voice be heard with respect to questions you want answered. Then uh, we also have handouts from today's presentation. They are available for download in the handout section. And if anyone is who watches the replay wants to find the handouts at the bottom of the player. 
So today's agenda, we're going to have a presentation on how to drive holiday growth from your loyalty program by David Henry, the Director of Product Marketing and Imperity. Then we're going to have audience polls where we ask you questions. Um, then we'll move into the panel discussion with Elf Beauty, Savage X Fenty, and Aerosols. So with that, I am excited to turn the mic over to David Henry. David, welcome to the virtual stage. Good morning. Thank you so much, Veronica. Let me make sure my slides are working here. So uh, super excited to join uh, the group today. We've got a really um, action-packed agenda and a great panel uh, to talk about loyalty. Obviously, you know, given the holidays, loyalty programs are kind of front and center for a, a lot of brands and a lot of retailers. So uh, we wanted to dig a bit deeper into that topic uh, just to help, you know, the, the variety of different businesses who are trying to solve this problem really approach it in a comprehensive manner. Um, you know, loyalty, you know, is popular for a reason, loyalty programs, and it's really because it unlocks what can be a pretty significant growth flywheel for brands. Um, and with the death of the first party or the third party cookie, rather, in particular, uh, establishing that named relationship with brands and starting to build that first party data profile has become a, a bigger and bigger priority for businesses. Um, and the way that we look at loyalty is really to figure out, you know, how can you get, number one, more people into uh, that loyalty program? How can you start to develop a stronger relationship with that customer really built on a robust understanding of who they are? So, you know, every time that a customer interacts with a brand, especially on digital channels, you know, that creates an opportunity, but it also creates a challenge. The opportunity is you can now collect data on that interaction, whether it's the products that they're viewing, the products that they purchased it, or the products that they purchased, what are their kind of digital behaviors, et cetera. Uh, but that's obviously a huge challenge in terms of how do you get all that data in one place? How do you start to put it into a data asset that you can leverage across your business? And then how do you ultimately turn that into more personalized experiences uh, for those loyalty members? Uh, and, and, you know, the beautiful thing about a highly successful loyalty program is that each of these three pillars really build on themselves. You know, the, the loyalty enrollment is what enables that uh, direct to consumer relationship. Uh, but as you interact with them more, you gain a better understanding of who they are. You can deliver more personalized experiences, which then kind of captivates that customer and really enables you to deepen that relationship. Uh, and this is what we partner with brands to do all of the time and really make sure that they have the, you know, appropriate technology architecture in place uh, to bring all these pieces together and make it happen. You know, one uh, shortcoming, I would say, of a lot of loyalty programs is they kind of operate out there on their own island. And, you know, the, the thing about customer loyalty is that it doesn't happen in, in one place. It, it's really the aggregate, the variety of different interactions that you have with that customer and how those different journeys roll up to the broader customer experience. And kind of taking a look at it more holistically, we found uh, has really been, you know, that driver of this, um, loyalty flywheel. And, and I wanted to talk about different levers that you all can pull this holiday season to grow that loyalty program more comprehensively. And we recommend that brands look at this in kind of three different buckets, if you will. So one is obviously acquisition. So how do you get more people into the program? Uh, activation is key here. So there's kind of two aspects of activation that uh, we think about. One is re-engaging lapsed members or folks that have gone dark. Uh, but then there's also activating new ones. So, you know, you've acquired somebody new to the program. How do you make sure that they hit the ground running and, and drive adoption off the bat? Uh, and then the third bucket is really just around more comprehensive program optimization and driving growth. So how do you uh, improve the ongoing adoption of loyalty programs and essentially prevent people from getting into that lapsed customer bucket? You know, one aspect of each of these that's an important thing to keep in mind, especially with the limited time frame that we have, you know, over the, let's say, next 60 days of holiday purchases, holiday returns, et cetera, uh, is really balancing between the strategies that you can apply and the potential reach that you can have with that audience. So I pulled a few different numbers from a uh, national coffee retailer uh, that we partnered with to work on their loyalty program. Uh, and there were a few things that kind of stuck out to me that were interesting. Uh, one is that the kind of addressable market of the audience side for acquisition was about 80 million in, in total unique customers. 
on the kind of activation side of things, they had about 10 million customers that were lapsed uh, that they could re-engage. Uh, and then on the growth side of things, they had about 20 million people who are in the program regularly using it. So when you think about, you know, where do you want to focus time, energy, resources, budget, and programs, think about that reach as well. You know, the, the 80 million is obviously really alluring uh, in terms of driving the biggest impact for the business. Because um, at the end of the day, from a re-engagement standpoint, you can only ever re-engage 10 million. So what can you do to impact those 80, bring back the 10 and grow the 20? Uh, you know, we've identified a few different strategies, you know, some suggestions to make an impact in each of these areas uh, that we've seen successful for some of the brands that we've partnered with. You know, on the acquisition side of things, this is a little counterintuitive. Uh, but purchase thresholding and, and really communicating a sense of exclusivity uh, has been really beneficial for brands. So I think Uber is an example, uh, not an Imperity customer, but a brand that does that uh, really well, where you have to spend a certain number of dollars on Uber in order to even qualify to join the loyalty program. And that just makes it more enticing for the folks that kind of have met that criteria, but maybe haven't yet uh, taken action. The other kind of interesting piece that you can think of in terms of acquisition, but really applied to activation and growth as well, is aligning the program incentives to the affinity of the customer. And what I mean by affinity is you can either take a look at what products are they most interested in, what categories maybe are they most interested in, uh, or alternatively, if you have more of a services component to, to, uh, of your business, how do you kind of align those benefits to the way that you draw people into the program? What does that carrot look like and how do you make it as personalized and compelling as possible? Uh, and then kind of up-leveling that uh, in conjunction with incentives or incentives and thresholding uh, is leveraging lookalike models to really fine tune your understanding of who are my loyalty members, who are my non-loyalty members, and who are the folks that maybe share a lot of characteristics with my high value loyalty customers, but haven't converted yet. And how do you focus those acquisition dollars, that digital marketing spend, the retargeting, et cetera, on bringing that cohort of folks into your loyalty uh, program more broadly? Um, on the activation side of things, the way I like to think about activation is how do you make it make, you know, it, it, it's got to be a total no brainer to uh, execute a transaction through the loyalty program. And I think the holiday season is a perfect opportunity uh, to leverage some of those incentives. And I think free returns, free shipping is a great way to make sure that it's not an anonymous transaction. Um, so if, for example, you can only do free holiday returns if you purchase through your loyalty program, that's a great way to get those people that maybe look like they've gone dark, but they're actually transacting outside of loyalty or with their work email or what have you. Uh, another good idea to kind of uh, get your loyalty program back on the top of mind of some of your lapsed customers is just giving them kind of an inside peek into maybe it's sales, maybe it's pre-ordering high demand gifts. You know, a lot of times there's two or three products within your product catalog that you have a pretty good idea are going to sell out in the earlier side of things. Uh, so maybe, you know, send that promotional email uh, right after Thanksgiving or right before to say, hey, you know, we've got these great gifts. We're going to give you as a loyalty member uh, the opportunity to place your order ahead of time. Uh, and then the third piece, this really depends on the nature of the business. But how do you incentivize card loading? Uh, and this is really around re-engaging those lap uh, members uh, and make it make sense for them to purchase that item uh, via card loading within your digital channels versus you know, uh, buying in store or buying uh, with their own personal credit card. Uh, the growth side of thing, I think, is an interesting uh, one as well, where, you know, early access to sales is a great idea. You know, Costco did this with me the other day. I was I'm on the market for a TV this holiday season. And they said, hey, David, uh, that TV you're really interested in is going to be on sale in a couple of weeks, uh, just so that you know. Uh, but that really kind of piqued my interest and uh, spoke to, you know, they knew that I was looking at TVs online. I kind of been in the market for a little while, but I was waiting for that right moment. So how do you kind of give them the inside scoop as active members of your loyalty program? Uh, and, and, you know, building on that uh, is this notion of exclusive rewards by tiers as well. You know, so some loyalty programs have tiers, some don't, uh, but just really emphasizing that exclusivity uh, and building on top of itself over time. 
uh, which dovetails, I think, really naturally with incentivizing cumulative gifting. You know, you don't want someone to just buy one gift from your store, for example. How do you get them to buy four, five, six, et cetera? Um, you know, one example that I have here is Nancy Boy, which is a, a small boutique uh, kind of, uh, what's the technical one? They do like shaving cream, you know, uh, shampoo, conditioner, et cetera, those types of products. Uh, and, and they get just a small token gift when you exceed $50 in an order or $100 in an order. And just kind of giving some of those carrots, especially to your most active, most loyal members. So they feel like they're getting something a little special that other people don't necessarily have access to. Um, and, and I wanted to, you know, those are all a whole bunch of great ideas, but I think looking at them in terms of performance and what's the potential upside is critical as well. And I wanted to leverage some data in conjunction with, you know, my opinions and experience, which is, uh, you know, the, the, Journal of, uh, the Journal of the Academy of Marketing Science put together a study. Uh, they analyzed three decades of scientific research on loyalty programs and kind of categorized some of these different tactics that you can leverage and really took a closer look at how did that impact uh, growth and retention in the long term. Uh, and, and they found there's, you know, three key buckets here. There's less performant strategies. So, you know, offering immediate generic discounts, for example, you know, get 10% off your order if you join the loyalty program. It, it didn't really pencil long term. It didn't draw people in. It didn't retain them. Uh, the, the other uh, tactic here uh, that was less performant is special attention rewards as well. So if you think about, you know, free drink on your birthday, for example, things like that uh, really didn't uh, grow that loyalty base. Equally performant, and I would put this in the bucket of good ideas, definitely worth building out, but uh, may or may not change your world is membership fees. You know, REI, Costco, Amazon do this very well uh, in terms of making you feel like, you know, if you're going to buy a product in that category, you're going to buy it from that retailer because A, you're a member and B, they're going to take care of you. Um, you know, loyalty members I touched on, I think it really depends on the nature of the business here as well. Uh, I, I think the more premium items that you offer, the, the bigger impact the loyalty tier can make, but something to consider there. And then on the more performant aspects of things, uh, you know, exclusivity, special events and products and priority service are going to win the day here. So how do you really offer a more robust experience for folks that are willing to establish that relationship, give you more data? Etc. And then how do those rewards tie back to the business that you that you offer and the core value of your product? So, you know, the kind of oddball, totally unrelated uh, incentives that, you know, say your REI, for example, you don't want to be giving away a bag of coffee, for example. It just doesn't really make sense. It doesn't click in with the business. So tying what you offer in your loyalty program to your core differentiators and why that customer does business with you it is going to have the greatest long-term impact uh, on your loyalty growth uh, over the long term. Uh, and I wanted to kind of tie all of this back together just with a uh, Imperity customer story. You know, we referenced a bunch of organizations that do some of this well, but I wanted to bring it back to Dick Sporting Goods, uh, who faced a pretty significant loyalty challenge that was ultimately underpinned by uh, some data complexity and a lot of kind of manual work and disconnected systems. And you know, one thing that they were trying to do was really uncover loyalty insights in their customer database uh, that they just didn't have access to. And you know, Dick's Sporting Goods is a very uh, large retailer. They have a lot of different customers that are transacting online. Some of them are transacting uh, in person. Uh, and, and one thing that they wanted to solve first and foremost was moving from a rules-based identity resolution uh, to AMP ID, which is probabilistic or kind of based on uh, machine learning. And the main difference here is kind of thinking of your customers as, you know, David at gmail.com is the same as David at gmail.com to, oh, you know, David at gmail.com actually might be the same as David at imparity.com because they have the same shipping address and kind of just applying a more robust understanding of who that customer is. Uh, and they were actually able to grow their overall marketing audience and the fidelity of that audience uh, by uh, leveraging AMP ID, which is a more robust solution to that problem. Uh, there are a few pieces here just around kind of just time and hours saved in terms of connecting the data pipes between some of their different, you know, uh, Google Cloud and BigQuery instances and their marketing systems and just smoothing out the processes for converting and collecting data in store and using that in digital channels. You know, I think COVID, you know, obviously made digital more important than ever. 
uh, and Dick's Sporting Goods wanted to be able to respond to that and, is, and capture as much uh, digital transactions and digital business as possible. Uh, and a big part of that was leveraging their customer data more broadly across their marketing stack and plugging it into Adobe campaign and customer journeys uh, with an Imperity integration. You know, one thing that I think is kind of cool is just really getting a finer degree of clarity on who is actually in your loyalty program, who are your highest value customers, and what do they look like? What do they care about? Uh, and Dick Sporting Goods kind of broke new ground in that sense in that they found uh, a little bit over 100,000 more gold tier loyalty members than they anticipated. And, and they were able to expand that marketing audience without more marketing dollars, just by taking a more uh, kind of specialized and focused approach to understanding who's who within their customer data and how do they leverage that to uh, make the biggest impact with those high value customers as possible. Uh, that wraps up the Amparity presentation of today, but I'm obviously going to be joining uh, the panel as well. So thank you so much for uh, hearing me out for a few minutes. I'm excited to join uh, the rest of the crew. Awesome. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, that was wonderful. Now, for the audience questions, we're going to do some polls. One second. Um, before I jump into the polls, just a quick reminder, if you want to see the poll results, um, in that right-hand panel, you just go to polls closed and you'll see the results of the closed polls. Um, so our first question, we want to get a sense of the loyalty experience among our audience. So do you currently have a loyalty program? And there's three options here. Yes, we have a loyalty program. No, but we're working on one. And C, no immediate plans to add a loyalty program. So again, the question is, do you currently have a loyalty program? Yes, we have a loyalty program. No, but we're working on one. No, The third answer is no immediate plans to add a loyalty program. Um, it seems like the majority of folks over 60% have a loyalty program. So I'm guessing you guys are tuning in to figure out how to optimize your loyalty program. So that's great. And then about 25% of the folks on this call are working on standing one up. So hopefully this will give you some food for thought in terms of how to do that. And for the folks that are not quite ready to have a loyalty program, maybe there's some inspiration available as a result of this webinar. So moving on to the next question, what kind of loyalty program incentives do you offer? So this is for the people who have loyalty programs. What kind of loyalty incentives do you offer? And you can select all that apply. And I kind of borrowed from David's slides because he had a lot of good options, but the first being discounts. Um, whether it's initial discounting to join or just special discounts for loyalty program members, um, special attention benefits like birthday promotions, points-based tiers where you earn rewards and um, prizes, special events slash products and priority services. So it's kind of, a, you know, we talked about some examples of that where there's products only available to loyalty members or special sales events. Rewards tied to business. So um, rewards tied to business. Now I'm trying to remember what I was thinking about this. Rewards tied to business. Oh, that's tied to a specific um, to a specific activity. So if you do a certain thing, then you earn reward points. And then the other, if we missed anything here that was relevant, um, please add that to the chat. Um, we'll take a look at that and comment on that as well. Well, not surprisingly, it looks like, well, people are rewarding different aspects of the business. The um, discounts seem to be the most popular way that they're rewarding them, although a lot of people are doing special attention birthday um, promotions and um, events. And the other, I'm going to check in the chat to see someone is doing something else. And if they want to share what they're doing, they can put it in the chat. Um, awesome. Thank you guys so much for taking that, answering that question. And then the last question is, um, what kind of loyalty engagement do you incentivize? So going back to, you know, first we were like, what kind of rewards are you giving out? Now, what, do you, what actions are you incentivizing through your loyalty program? And the first option is A, purchases from your brand.com site. So any purchases made on the site that you operate. Um, B is for kind of for brands that sell on third party retail sites. Um, do you incentivize purchases made from the retail.com site? C is social engagement. So posting on social media, using a certain hashtag. 
D is customer referrals. E is ratings and reviews, so incentivizing customers to review products. And then F, if we miss something, you know, feel free to specify um, anything else that you're incentivizing. All right, so results are coming in here. It looks like the majority um, is incentivizing purchases from the brand.com site, which makes sense. That's that's a few people are also um, incentivizing purchases from the retail.com site, which is great. Social engagement. Um, so it looks like about 15% are incentivizing social engagement. 21% are incentivizing customer referrals. 16% ratings from reviews. And I, and someone else has something else that they're incentivizing. Um, but just that's a small percentage of folks. So um, that is it for that question. Um, and then our final question is tied to next week's webinar, which is a new year, a new e-commerce reality, differentiating through digital experience. And the question is, how do you collect data for your personalization efforts? And this is also a select all that apply. A is encourage sign up and log in. B is in-store engagement with digital tools. So clienteling or email capture or SMS um, phone number capture. Um, Inferred based on browsing and shopping behaviors, on-site quizzes and questions, purchase third-party data for life events like marriage, new home purchase, or something else. How do you collect data from your personalization efforts? Um, and Allison McGuire had a great suggestion where they also use their preference center to um, collect more personalized, more more personalized data, more data for personalization efforts. So in terms of the results, 42% encourage signups and login. Um, we're, that's the most popular option. 22% um, are inferring based on browsing behavior, which at least for now we can do. 16% um, um, in-store engagement, 14% on-site quizzes and questions, and then um, only 4% through purchase of third-party data for things like life events. Awesome. We can close that out. And now I'm excited to bring the panelists up on stage so we can start the panel portion of our discussion. Welcome, everyone. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so um, David gave a presentation. We got to meet David. But I want to really bring Ekta, Stephanie, and Wu into the conversation and have you guys introduce yourselves talk a little bit of, and also just talk a little bit about your loyalty program or in the case of Savage X Fenty, your membership model. And actually, Stephanie, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you and talk about um, if you want to kick things off and then we'll go around. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. I am Stephanie O'Sullivan, Vice President of Growth at Savage X Fenty. I oversee CRM, media buying and acquisition strategy. So I'm here to offer a little bit of a different perspective because Savage is a subscription membership model business. Um, we call our customers VIPs, so I might refer to that a few times during this chat. We do charge a monthly membership subscription um, of $49.95, but you can shop, skip as many times as you want throughout the year. Um, and I'm excited to kind of share uh, some more information about our business and, and how we approach loyalty and our VIP benefits during this conversation. Awesome. And I was excited that you were joining this conversation because I think the nature of the textile businesses is, is fundamentally like loyalty is at its core and you have a very different approach than a lot of kind of traditional brands, which is, which is an interesting perspective. Exactly. Ekta, do you want to go next? Sure. So I'm Ekta Chopra. I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Elf Beauty. And um, for us, a loyalty program is at the heart uh, of, you know, how we run our um, DGC business. So, and it's a true omni-channel um, loyalty program. And when I say that, we recently, actually just three weeks ago, relaunched it um, with additional benefits, which are very personalized to the consumer. And I refer to them as our Beauty Squad members. And Beauty Squad members um, now can buy anywhere they like, 
scan a receipt and also redeem rewards for any retailer or Venmo or PayPal. So it's really personalized to their needs, wants, and desires. And we encourage them to be part of the membership as well as shop Elf product wherever they want. So that's, that's in a nutshell, our loyalty program. And that's really clever. That's why I kind of asked that question in our poll in our polls to see if anyone else was also looking at retail.com purchases. It's an interesting strategy because then you you can start connecting with customers that may not be shopping your site directly. So it's a way to kind of build that exactly. relationship with them. Yeah. Woo. Hi, everyone. Um, also, it's that time again of the year. So happy <laughs> Q4. Uh, my name is Wu, and I run e-commerce at Aerosols, which is a women's footwear brand. And we offer a points-based loyalty program with dollar discounts for the actual redemption. And then we have, that's across three VIP tiers. Each tier obviously unlocks more benefits, uh, exclusive access and other perks, and then more points for every dollar spent. So very excited to talk about loyalty today. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, let's start by kind of talking about the value of a loyalty customer, because, you know, I think there's there's some assumptions that loyalty customers are more valuable than, you know, non-loyalty shoppers. Um, Ekta, I mean, can you kick things off? What's the value of each incremental loyalty member for Elf Beauty? Yeah, for us, 70% um, of our sales on our site comes from loyalty members, which is, you know, pretty incredible. We have now close to 2.7 million loyalty members, and that continues to grow. And we're really encouraged by the new loyalty program where we want to add more members. And I think there's a value to a loyalty member just beyond the transactions on the site. The first party data really helps you optimize your media buys and uh, the audiences that you want to reach out to. So I think, um, you know, oftentimes we just put a dollar number to it, but the, the incremental value of what that can do for optimization of media, as well as just, you know, reaching out to new audiences is tremendous. So just taking a look at all of that. Wu, anything you want to add to that? Are you, are you looking at the value of your loyalty members versus non-loyalty members? Yes. So in terms of the loyalty program, you know, the Pareto principle rings true and through and through. Um, we have about a 74% repeat purchase rate from our loyalty members, whereas our non-loyalty members is a 17% 17 uh, 17 repeat purchase rate. So it's a pretty stark difference in terms of the, the brand loyalists that we see in the loyalty program. That's a, that's a, that's an amazing difference. It makes you really want to kind of get people who purchase into the loyalty program um, with the hopes that they then have that higher customer lifetime value. Um, David, you 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 kicked off your presentation like with the flywheel of of how you kind of look at loyalty, acquiring and retaining customers. Can you talk about how brands go about calculating the value of a loyal customer and just kind of what are you seeing in general in terms of the value of a loyalty member versus a non-loyalty member, if you can kind of talk in broad terms? Sure. So one aspect of loyalty customers that I think is interesting is they are the most likely people to have the messiest data because <laughs> they interact with you more often. Um, and sometimes, you know, maybe they're shipping something to a family member's house. Maybe they're using a work email. Maybe they got married. You know, the, the more likely you are to have a long-term relationship with that customer, the more likely uh, it is that you could have different records of who they are as a customer. So I would say the first thing to think about is, is how do you gain clarity on who those customers are and how are you ensuring that you are uh, applying an intelligent approach to the way that you deduplicate and, and resolve identity for that customer base. Um, so that I would say is the absolute first step. Um, the average deduplication rate that we see at Imperity is about 45%. Uh, now that can vary, <laughs> uh, but it's still a high number. So I would say start with identity. And the second piece is, is don't think about uh, loyalty um, in a silo and kind of think about a couple different dimensions. One is the lifetime value of that customer. What's the aggregate spend? But also, you know, what's the profitability of that customer? Um, are your loyalty members not just spending more, uh, but are they a more profitable 
uh, customer base? Uh, and how do you really discern who's who within uh, that broader population? Uh, and the folks that you know take a step back and recognize that you need to do that before you send any kind of email campaign um, are the ones that we found uh, have been able to make the biggest impact on the bottom line in the long term. Awesome. Um, definitely surprised me when you said the loyalty customers are the ones that have the messiest data, because you would assume that they're logged in and you know exactly who they are, but I guess I if they're shopping they the site a lot, then they probably have a lot of different identities that they might be using yeah. to shop. Um, we have an audience question that I think is really relevant. Um, and I want to kind of interject here from Amanda Lashid, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, have you noticed if there is a single tactic in particular that works best to move members within levels of your loyalty program. And Wu, I know you have levels in your loyalty program. So maybe would you mind tackling that question? And are you seeing anything in particular that's helping people kind of graduate people from one tier to another? Yeah. So the thing that we largely focus on is just kind of awareness and messaging that through and through. So you know, we kind of go between reminding people how many points that they already have, how how many points that they've already accrued. If they can spend X dollars more, they can unlock, you know, their next discount. So it's just awareness. Um, and we do that consistently in our post-purchase flow, our just standard newsletters. We actually have a segment of our loyalty customers that we bring in. So we are very clear on who's a loyalty member, even within our email newsletters. Um, and then also as account holders, one of the things that we're looking into now from like a site UX perspective is to give them that reminder when they're on the site. So I think it's just consistent reminders is something that we're focusing on. Yeah. And Ekta, I can't remember now, do you have tiers in your program as well? Yeah, we do, we do have tiers in our program um, as well. And anything to add to that, that any other tips in terms of how to get people from one tier to another? Yeah, I think uh, for us, absolutely agree with Wu on sort of the messaging stra strategy, the reminders, you know, that sort of engage the consumer. But I think a little bit more is like sort of, do you in your program have stuff that, you know, loyalists really want to engage with? So that element of personalization and rewarding earning and, you know, using those rewards in how they want to do is very critical to the success of our program. And that's where we've seen that every time we add something that our loyalists really care about, we see them moving up the tier. Um. Awesome. And that's, I guess, kind of speaks to the fact that there's, it's not just about purchases, but there could be multiple behaviors that they could engage in that could, that could help drive them, drive loyalty behavior and, and kind of earn points. Exactly. Exactly. Um, awesome. Um, then moving along here. Um, and actually this relates to the next audience question. So I'm going to tie the two together. Um, the question that I originally had here was how did how did you evaluate and establish your loyalty program benefits? But there's also an audience question, and I by the way, I love it that we have so many audience questions. It's because we haven't covered this. And people have a lot of a lot of questions, but they're asking how um, are the are the brands loyalty programs using ho are you using homegrown technology or are you using third party loyalty vendors? And if so, which vendors? So um, that question came from Christine Dolce. Um, so I guess two questions packed in one, how are you kind of thinking about establishing your tiers and benefits? And the second question is, did you build your own, um, platform or are you using a third party solution for your loyalty programs? And Ekta, I guess I'll start, start with you on this one. Sure. We are using a third party solution. It's Crowd Twist, which was acquired by um, Oracle. And what we love about the platform is that it puts the power in the marketing team's hands. So taking away sort of any friction where everything needs to be customized and gone to the tech team and so forth to make it as an offer, it puts the power in the team that's going to analyze the consumer loyalty behavior and either add new offers or optimize the current offer. So I think that's the reason why we love what we have selected and really encouraged by sort of the launch and the initial results that we're starting to see. Um, yeah. And how did you think about the benefits? Because you just recently relaunched your program. So when you were like thinking yeah. about what you 
want to offer mm -hmm. your members? Like, how did you determine what would move the needle? I think it's a it's a it's been a journey for us. So when we launched originally back in 2017, um, online only loyalty program, it was a very simple earn and burn type of a program because we just wanted to see, hey, does this even is some is this something that our consumers even want? Then we made that at that time we had stores. Then we made that sort of like a hey, you can buy online, pick up at store, you can do all of this stuff, and if you become a member, you get these additional benefits. But the question still was that 20% 20, 20 of our business is D2C, but 80% is retailer, you know, retailer based. How do you make a program that's going to engage you with that customer that's actually shopping at Walmart, Target, Amazon, and all these other places? Because to us, it doesn't matter where they shop as long as we maintain that engagement with them and we are sort of the destination that they come to to learn, educate, see new products. Sale would be nice too. But, you know, our main purpose of the program is really engaging with the consumer that's even going beyond our D2C channel. So then we evolved the program to include receipt scanning. And then we said, hey, receipt scanning, great. We're starting to see some momentum. But the online experience of receipt scanning is mm, it's not the best. So then we launched an app. Now we see that the most engaged consumers on the app are the ones who are our true you know, loyalty members. And they're scanning a lot more receipts because scanning a receipt from a mobile device is much simpler. Then we learned that, hey, you know, if we really want to make this powerful, let's just not reward them for shopping with us, right? Not, you know, let's give them cards to, if they're an Ulta member, they might want to redeem at Ulta. So that's how we ended up where we are. So it's been an evolution and a learning. And every time we learn something, we go take action and make sure that it's serving the consumer as best way as possible. So it sounds like you've taken a very iterative approach and kind of very yeah. data-driven and testing different, different, um, different elements of the loyalty program and then just constantly updating it. Wu, anything you want to add there from, from your experience with aerosols? Yeah, for us, we first thing was we wanted to make it as clear as possible for the user and the customer, right? So if we gam gamify it too much and we're trying to be meticulous about our calculations from a business perspective and a bottom line perspective, you know, we might lose the fact that the customer goes, wait, so how many points do I need? So the first thing was for the customers to just understand, okay, how many points equal, you know, a dollar discount or how many points can I get in this tier? And then secondly, the other thing was just kind of the, the number of average orders. So obviously before, you know, someone joins a loyalty program, what is, what is our AOV? What is the number of average orders? And then that's how we came up with the tiers. Um, and then from a partner, we use a vendor. We actually use Yapo. And our largely our decision was driven by, you know, we already used Yapo for ratings and reviews. And as David mentioned earlier, in terms of just data integrity, the messiness of data, I think as marketers, when we can connect the dots between every touch point and understand, you know, who's doing what and when is super critical for us. So having that all under one umbrella of a loyalty and referral program, you know, the ratings and reviews, and then also just our visual gallery, being able to connect that as, you know, a way to earn points, that was really our largest decision. Um, that makes sense. By having the same platform across everything, you're able to kind of track more of the behaviors. Um, exactly. Stephanie, I, I want to bring you into the conversation, I think, um, and kind of focus a little bit on the holiday season. Um, I was reading how Best Buy is giving their loyalty members preferred access to popular products that will likely be out of stock this holiday season. And I thought that was like a really smart way of kind of catalyzing loyalty. Um, are you doing anything special for your loyalty members this holiday? Can you talk about what you're doing at Savage X Fenty? Yeah, absolutely. So unlike some, like, uh, unlike some of the other programs where they're tiered, kind of loyalty members, um, all of our VIPs have the same suite of benefits when they opt in to our membership. Um, in terms of holiday, we have 
coming up soon um, to visit the site in a couple of weeks. Some exclusive promotions. We have early events for our VIPs. Um, we have curated products and bo exclusive boxes for our VIPs, which is really special for them. Um, we, some at some points during the year, and we will for the holiday season, have um, an exclusive product assortment, and we'll be pulsing out different events, um, events, promotions, online events for them this year um, to really kind of uh, reinvigorate their love of shopping and get them really engaged with um, with Savage this this season. Awesome. And, and Stephanie, just for the audience that benefits, people can sh can shop Savage X like without being um, in the VIP program. But with the VIP program, they're getting a lot more benefits in terms of like exclusive sales and things like that, plus um, discounts and, and things like that. Is that how the program yes. Yeah. So someone can come on and shop like a regular e-com site, but the beauty of our, of our business model is that we are adding so much value to the VIP membership that, um, it's a hard thing to say no to sometimes as a customer. Um, it's, it's hard for me to say no to every month when we have our collection drops and our mid month drops. And so, um, are you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, Veronica, but, our business model is inherently a loyalty program um, because of, of this suite of benefits that we consistently offer to our VIPs to come back each month and, and engage with. Awesome. Um, Ekta Wu, anything you want to add? Any, any other kind of holiday, any special holiday related benefits for your customers? Yeah. Similar to Best Buy, like we have, um, you know, sort of gated some offers for the loyalty members. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's like giving them that special exclusivity that, hey, if you did this, you know, you could buy it sooner than somebody else. Um, free shipping is another lever that we offer with our um, loyalty members. But from a holiday perspective, it's just the messaging. Hey, you, you have so many rewards right now. Go and use them. Now you can redeem a Target gift card. Get it for your loved one. You know, so things like that. So when we see that people have a lot of rewards that they haven't redeemed yet, we'll use that as an opportunity, especially for holidays, to encourage them to redeem it and, and you know, get something somewhere else if they want. Treat yourself this holiday season. There you go. Yeah, Teach your own. Good. That's right. <laughs> the thing uh, that we're doing, I think, and I'm sure everyone is in this boat with the the, the global supply chain supply. delay. In <laughs> so something that we're thinking about doing is, right, we're fully aware of the inventory that we currently, you know, have in a physical location. Um, so you know, giving double points to things that we have high inventory levels of so we can secure, you know, kind of that sales and top line growth. So that's something that we're thinking about, especially for this year. Awesome. Uh, we're getting a lot of audience questions. It's so exciting. Um, I'm going to go to a question from Donna Yi. She asked, um, how do you measure um, that loyalty program is driving incremental revenue and not necessarily taking money away um, if, if you're going to make that purchase anyway. So how do you make, how do you kind of measure that it's really driving incremental sales and the, would you think AB testing is the best way or how do you approach this, um, with a loyalty provider that has AB testing limitations? And I guess, David, do you, do you want to take that question? Yeah. Uh, so I saw this one came, come in and, uh, an account can't reference them, but an account immediately stuck out where we're solving a very similar challenge and and we found loyalty programs are oftentimes some of the best folks with which you can test and learn and run some of these experience with folks that you know to the points that we've already made you have a named relationship you know who they are you know what they're doing etc um so absolutely um a b testing within this cohort is uh a, a great way to learn how to drive the business forward um we certainly recommend uh, an A, B, and a holdout where you are specifically tracking incremental revenue um, with those audiences by taking a look at the transactional data as well. Um, so within Amparity, there's a way to do that. Um, th this is, I think, where it, it becomes harder to solve this problem comprehensively with a single loyalty point solution. It takes a, a more comprehensive data approach. 
um, especially when you're dealing in an omni-channel environment. Um, but yeah, 100%, um, you know, tying strategies to incremental uh, revenue, taking a look at that holdout and, and really getting a pulse for not just opens and clicks and kind of the metrics that marketers are used to keeping track of, uh, but how does this literally impact incremental revenue uplift compared to folks that are not a part of it whatsoever? Um, yeah. and, and loyalty is a great way to get that done. So um, use your CRM. Go ahead, Efta. I'm sorry, Veronica. I was going to say, uh, can I add something to this? Because I think this uh, needs to be said. I think sometimes people think that, you know, hey, I'm going to get the le best loyalty program and I'm going to acquire all these people. That's great. But uh, the reason why I think David is bringing up such great points is there's plumbing that's needed to be set up before you can truly leverage the power of your loyalty numbers or your first party data. That plumbing is the customer data platform with a you know, ident unique identification where all of this data is coming through and your marketing teams are actually using that to build segments and audiences and holdouts and who you're gonna go after, who's more valuable, who has not done so something for a certain amount of time. So I think just to sort of wrap this up in this into this is like, hey, it's not just the loyalty program, but it's the plumbing that you need to think of before you can truly unlock the power of your loyalty uh, data. Very good point. And and I and, and that's critical with with anything. So I guess Donna, I guess to the point of your question, um, if your loyalty program partner can't necessarily do the A-B testing, it sounds like maybe your CRM and CDP partner can help you with um, doing a holdout group so you can truly measure the incremental value. Um, I want to kind of turn to loyalty program structures. I want to I have a question for Stephanie because you charge for your loyalty program. Um, it's a it's a monthly fee. Uh, talk about kind of the origin of that decision and why did you decide to do a paid for loyalty program versus a free loyalty program? Yeah, so I it's a it's a very, very flexible membership. You can join and never be charged for the month if you want and still come back and shop and get the same suite of benefits that um, that you would if you if you chose to shop at the top of the month and and be charged for that membership fee. Um, I think that our goal is to offer value and that value comes with the suite of benefits that we have and that we offer our VIPs. Um, I think that we've been, we kind of have this like built in, this built in retention funnel because of our business model. We ask that our VIPs come back at the top of each month and shop or skip. Um, and so that first week of the month is so important for us. That's why we have turn of month drops, new collection launches, so on and so forth. And so because of that, we've been able to focus so much of our efforts on acquisition instead of retention because our business model is so focused around loyalty and retention already. Um, and so a lot of our focus is on making sure that we're really like juicing that funnel and getting the right people into our business and thinking about um, how we can we can best identify VIPs that will um, be attracted to our program across the variety of media channels that we're advertising on right now. Um, I didn't really answer why we went didn't go free necessarily, but if you look at textile and our models in general, Savage right now sits under textile. So we're with like Fabletics and Shoe Dazzle and Just Fab, and we all have this very similar, maybe not same, but very similar business model. Um, and it works, it works really well for us. Um, it creates a really engaged audience. They they expect um, value, but they also expect constant newness from us, which um, which creates that really great continuous relationship with our customer. Yeah. And you guys have been doing it for a long time, but it's a trend that you see now. I mean, obviously, the, the most famous one being Prime and, and, you know, which has hundreds of millions of members. But now, you know, Best Buy had launched a premium rewards program, and you're starting to see that more as a trend where, you um, your, I saw Anthropology was testing one 
where you buy into the loyalty program and then you get a certain suite of benefits that um, that are then kind of um, that you can kind of redeem throughout the year. Um, it's amazing how quickly we're going. Uh, and we have so many great questions. I want to talk really quickly about customer data, which we touched on in, in a prior webinar, but I feel like with loyalty programs, you have a unique opportunity to collect a lot of customer data. Um, and I'm going to combine this with two things. Sarah McMahon asked, do you see stronger performance when loyalty members declare or update their preferences on different types of marketing messages? So I guess tune how much communication they want to receive. Um, and then related to that, I think is, you know, how are you collecting data from your loyalty program um, customers? Are you doing quizzes, games, reviews, anything you're doing to collect additional data? Um, I guess, Ekta, maybe I'll start with you on this one. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're always looking at ways to collect more data. So if you think about um, what we have is a beauty profile and the beauty profile, essentially, we um, target different uh, uh, loyalty members to complete that profile, essentially. What's your likes, dislikes, skin type, all of that stuff. And, then, and I think the more information we have about that consumer, that loyalty member, the better content we can develop, the messaging, it impacts the full ecosystem. And we recently partnered with another uh, vendor called Jebit. They offer these exper quiz experiences where then you can con collect more information regarding personal, you know, personal preferences and so forth. So we're trying to infuse uh, different ways to collect more information, as well as then how do, does that information inform your content and your messaging strategy? Awesome. And Stephanie, you start off with a quiz. In your, in your whole flow. <laughs> we do, yeah. I mean, it's it's optional, but the majority of our of our prospects and our leads go through our quiz funnel. Um, it, it to the to the question that you originally asked, we do see stronger conversion when leads or prospects go through that funnel and provide us with um, more information. We find that they're more engaged and they're more willing um, and wanting to to convert and more engaged with our product. Um, when our leads do go through our funnel they tell us, you know, it's a style quiz. So they tell us what their, you know, favorite colors are, what their go-to colors are, what styles they're looking for right now, what product categories they're shopping, um, where they live so that we can make sure that we ship to them, so on and so forth. Their size, size filtering is a really big thing for us because we have a very wide range of sizes that we, that we offer to our customers. And so with all that information, we're then able to personalize um, their site experience. We make sure that on the landing pages that they visit, we prioritize size filtering and categories that, that they're interested in. And similar to Acta's point about engaging that um, data through all of the ecosystem, we leverage all of that knowledge in our in our email sends, SMS, you know, whatever medium the customer uh, wants to be communicated to, and um, and we're able to personalize their experience that way too, which which does uh, perform really well for us. Awesome. So you really using it to personalize. Uh, well, we're running out of time. I want to kind of I know it's a busy time of year, and all of you are hiring, and you have a uh, an audience in the community that is filled with people <laughs> that would, would potentially be relevant. So I want to get a, for one, the final question, I just want to go around, like, are you hiring? Where can people find out more? What type of roles? Um, Stephanie, I'll quickly start with you and then we'll go around. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, our org is definitely hiring. Look at Savage's <laughs> LinkedIn, Textiles LinkedIn. I personally am hiring for a director of CRM. Um, so I'm looking for a rock star there. If, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I always answer. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Woo. Yes, definitely hiring. Uh, as e-com is growing, um, we are hiring for a growth marketing manager on my team. So, Likewise, as Stephanie said, please reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, always, always will answer. Ekta. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hiring, man. Reach out. LinkedIn. <laughs> we have posted jobs. Um, definitely looking for rock stars in CRM, customer service, e-com. Um, so join my team. Join my team. <laughs> David, is Imperity hiring? 
We sure are. And, and, and we hire <laughs> on the software side, but we also hire a lot of folks from industry. So if, if any of you folks on the line are interested in moving over to the dark side of, of, of software and working with the vendor, uh, feel free to reach out. Also on LinkedIn, uh, we're hiring across the board. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us, for sharing your insights with our community. As you can see, there was a lot of questions. So this has been like a pent up demand to learn more about loyalty programs. So really appreciate all of you taking the time. And for those that are tuning in, thank you for joining us. We're back next week, November 17th with our webinar on a new year, a new e-commerce reality, differentiating through digital experience. We look forward to seeing you soon. See you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.